We're going to start off today's session by looking at the prevalence of balance problems in infants, and in particular, the prevalence of balance problems and also vestibular, as we'll delve a little bit more into, in infants that we see uh, with hearing impairment, or certainly ones that we're seeing with suspected hearing impairment, where the hearing element is, is of key interest to us. And why that? why is that important? Well, hopefully as today uh, moves on, we'll start to see pieces of this Jokosol puzzle come together and create a, a more compelling uh, reason why those of us that are seeing uh, patients uh, to look at hearing and trying to maximise interventions for them to have successful access to, to hearing and sound may also find ourselves able to look at balance and vestibular function. But before we dive into children and infants, let's just take a little step back and, and think about what audiology really has quite a strong uh, background in. And we have a long standing history of looking at hearing, vestibular and balance assessment over the lifespan. Albeit that has been something that is focused particularly from the balance and vestibular perspective towards the adult. And there are very good reasons for that, of which we can go into a little bit of detail today, but really today is not about testing adults. But diagnostic testing, as we see it now, particularly in vestibular imbalance, has predominantly focused around looking at reduction in function in an adult that has had previously normal function. So it's a slightly different perspective when we start to move into children and particularly infants. So in this younger population, and, you know, I've kind of covered the range that takes them up into higher education. Predominantly, we have got great success in trying to um, access satisfactory hearing so that speech and language development uh, can be achieved. But actually, when we move into that further part of the, uh, the sentence there, the more to milestones on access to education to provide equal life opportunities, we'll see that the narrative actually includes balance. And by balance, then we're talking about vestibular function, audiology perspective, but balance is a much bigger, bigger element. And we'll unpack a little bit of that again today. But let's just start where we're a little bit more familiar and we'll go back into that inner ear structure and just give ourselves a little bit of an overview. And don't worry, we're not doing a deep dive into the anatomy and physiology. We're just going to orientate ourselves around this balance organ. So when we look at balance function from an ear perspective, and again, I'll start to throw a few caveats in here about why we've got to be a little bit careful about calling the inner ear vestibular system the balance organ, because it truly isn't. And hopefully, if I've done a reasonable job today, by the end of our session, we will have understood a little bit more about what balance function actually really is and how we can conceptualize that just beyond uh, the ear. So here we've got the semicircular canals, these little tubes that we're familiar with, the anterior, lateral and posterior, that uh, orientate for angular acceleration. So what that really means is when we move our head from side to side or up and down at varying different speeds, those little tubes send the sensory information up to the brain and the brain coordinates that and makes some uh, reflexive uh, reflex uh, uh, actions through both the eyes and the rest of the body to um, to maintain uh, mobility and uh, vision particularly now one of the other areas i think which is probably a little bit less well understood and again uh, part of the the vestibular system uh, is the otolith system so here we've got the saccular system and the saccular system is actually quite critical in relation to gravity so linear acceleration and again uh, keep that little bit of the the organ in mind because i'll probably refer back to that uh, in a couple of uh, uh, talks time as well and we've got the utricular system. So these are the two paired elements of the saccule and the utricular forming the autolith organ. So let's call that the gravity sense. So it's the uh, part of the vestibular system that provides information to the brain about the orientation of body uh, in and head in space. So whether we, it's the organ that gets activated if we go up and down a lift or when we're moving uh, around relative to a, a gravity force. And there it is tucked away just in the in the central part of that that diagram. So now that we've got ourselves orientated around the inner ear, let's have a look at the, the way in which that vestibular system integrates uh, and develops uh, in an infant. So what we what we see uh, at birth is actually the vestibular sensory system 
is one of the first parts of that inner ear structure to develop. In fact, way before quite a lot of the skull itself in terms of its function is laid down, hence why it becomes a labyrinth inside there with the cochlea. And then as we get uh, further and further into pregnancy and closer and closer to birth, the myelation starts to, to really develop and we effectively get a sensory organ that, that is fully formed before birth. However, as we know with the uh, with the cochlea and certainly with the, the neural networks that flow out from the cochlea, there is a degree of maturity that is required for those systems as they develop uh, post-birth and certainly the vestibular system is no uh, different to that. However, there is an even bigger picture that we'll cross into uh, a bit more detail as we go through uh, today's session. So predominantly at the very beginning of a child's life, they are very dependent on visual clues. So in other words, they use their eyes almost as their primary function for um, orientation. And that works reasonably well when the environment's not too complex or there's not too much sensory information that's being, being played with. But again, we'll touch of why that becomes less successful as, we, as the child gets a little bit older. And then as we move into uh, sort of the, the slightly older child and teenage child, what they then do is they develop a resolution of these different sensory uh, conflicts, both visual conflict, somatory sensory, which we'll touch into a little bit as well, just to explain what that is, and the vestibular system. And by roughly 12 to 16 years of age, the systems will come together uh, and the brain, the neural networks will be able to uh, create what effectively then becomes balance uh, and successful balance. So really balance, as defined by Shumway Cook and Woolacott, is really this organised response to sensory information. And by sensory information and input, we're really referring to both the somatory sensory senses, so skin, tactile touch, stretch receptors, musculoskeletal system, uh, giving orientation of the body with the visual system and the vestibular uh, system sitting up in the inner ear providing information to the central nervous system, the brain, to orientate us for balance. So the peripheral apparatus, the vestibular system, uh, provides information up into the central nervous system, into the brain, for central processes to be undertaken. And really then the output of that, the motor output, but also the orientation output, is what we then term as balance. So that could incorporate things like eye movements, as we mentioned a little bit, uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, fine motor skills, in fact, in terms of uh, moving the hand or feet or body in micro adjustments for balance. Also other complex type movements where we may be much more mobile um, or, or undertaking much more complex balance tasks. So really, this idea of, of central coordination, the central nervous system, this is about strategies to maintain and restore balance. And again, this is another key element. So the central nervous system, this central coordination, really, if we peel that back a little bit further, we're talking about incredibly complex neural networking models to restore and maintain balance that are reflexive. So these take time to develop. And again, we'll put that to one side and hang that because we'll come back to it and we'll explore that a little bit further of why that is important when we're looking and assessing a child and we're trying to establish whether they've got good access to sensory information for balance. So we've got postural stability when we talk about balance. So that's how well somebody stood still. So that's maintaining our body center of gravity over a base of support. So it's the kind of thing we do when we're standing in line. And then we've got postural mobility, which eventually is that when we want to move out of line and move forward, we have to accelerate our center of gravity and initiate movement in an appropriate direction, all of which is a balance function and all of which requires good access to sensory information and good neural networks for the brain to carry out the reflexive subconscious activity that is required to negotiate in complex environments. And that's really one of the key things in, and the thing that is quite exciting about balance, but actually also makes it very complex. And as we said, that has to happen in any given environment. So it doesn't matter where we take ourselves. We assume, and uh, quite rightly, um, that our balance will be able to cope with that. But of course, these are all learned activities and have to be modified. And sometimes the balance system actually has to modify to a completely new environment and deal with sensory conflict as well and do error changing. 
And that in itself requires quite complex neural networks to be able to be manipulated. So again, when we start talking about balance, we'll see within this session that actually, although we're very um, focused on the ear, because this is a component that we are uh, largely responsible for in our hearing care industry, and, but it's a, it's a key element but not all the elements uh, that are required when we look at balance. So we started thinking about this, about the prevalence of balance problems in infants. And particularly what I've done here is say infants with sensory neural hearing loss. So we've refined it down to the population that we are more likely to see in our pediatric audiology uh, clinics. And what we have here is we've got a bit of a, a, a balancing uh, act between the degree of hearing loss and the degree then of associated uh, balance impairment. So if we just take sensory neural hearing loss, and we won't define how many that be, you, you, you guys are much more of an expert of what that is, and we know what the, the data is in terms of um, congenital hearing loss. But if we take those sensory neural kids that you see, amongst those, about 70% of them will have some form of vestibular impairment or some form of change to their vestibular system. And of those, so of that 70%, 35 to 40% reported in the literature of those children will have a bilateral involvement. So both inner ear vestibular systems will be impaired. And that's a big significant factor when we start talking about uh, balance and balance function and what that means to a child as they develop. So I don't know if those numbers surprise you. They certainly still surprise me. And I've worked in balance and vestibular for a very long time because uh, having worked in a very uh, busy department uh, with uh, quite a large uh, pediatric uh, population as well, alongside a, an auditory implant center, I don't think we were seeing and assessing or being asked to assess as many children as those numbers would suggest. And I think that's that's fairly universal. Um, so, you know, it's not a failing of any of the systems, but it's something to highlight another element that when we're really focusing on the ear, then maybe there's another part to, to consider also. So, okay, with those children that we're seeing then, what should I be looking out for? Well, reported history in children is very, very different to adults. So if, you, if we're talking to a vestibular audiologist dealing with adults, they can give you a very long list of key information that they forensically can pull out to give them an indication of what degree of vestibular involvement they believe exists. Children are very, very different. So they are dealing with developing systems so that could be looking at where they're where they're at for their motor milestones. Um, it could be that they are not developing uh, walking uh, as successfully or that um, if they're an older child, that actually some of the elements that you would expect to come into play, like reading and other elements, are, are being delayed. And there doesn't seem to be an explanation for why that might be. And again, we've got poor dynamic visual acuity here, and I'll come back to that as well. The one thing that children do not, uh, in my experience, describe very frequently, and certainly not in the um, in the context of sensory neural hearing loss and changes in the ear from the vestibular part is vertigo. So that vertigo is that term we use uh, in the medical uh, fields of a true rotational spinning dizziness. So think merry-go-round type dizziness. Children actually don't describe that very clearly. And there's very few, uh, there's quite a few reasons for that, um, but it's not a great descriptor for looking at ear related dizziness as it is with adults. Um, so we, we, we'll put that to one side as well. So, so signs and symptoms. Well, um, there, there's a whole range. And uh, again, I'm a little bit cautious about throwing out too many and too few because, um, you know, you can effectively create a net that's far too broad. However, some of the common ones are children that seem unexplained fright, alarm or terror. And we'll come to why that might be a little bit further in, the, in today's session. Complains of blurred vision. So this is the dynamic visual acuity we were talking about. This might impair reading and concentrating when reading. It may actually influence them where they can't see clearly when they're moving and mobilizing around. Uh, motion sickness. Now, motion sickness is relatively common in children, um, but is it common because they have a vestibular impairment that we've not been aware of? Or is it that children just generally uh, can have um, some motion sickness? Uh, they can have motion sickness, so we're not we're not going to have that as a red flag for every child that may then have a vestibular component, but it is more common in those that do have um, peripheral vestibular issues.
Also, periodic episodes of nausea or vomiting. There are certain things that certain conditions, and we'll, we'll brief, touch on a few of them, that can uh, induce these episodes of nausea or vomiting in children that could be an indicator, again, of, of a pathology uh, affecting the vestibular system. Um, difficulty moving around in the dark or in low light or when visual clues are impaired, particularly in a, in a slightly older child, a three to four to five year old, could be an indicator they're not accessing vestibular sensory information. Uh, as we said, delayed motor functions. And again, we'll touch on what that actually means, because sometimes this isn't just walking. Um, it could be functions that go beyond that, uh, such as riding a bike, for example. Uh, clutching um, uh, their carers or so guardians, parents or stationary objects and they're moving. Children that often can then sometimes be described as clingy, uh, particularly when they're in unfamiliar environments. That can also be an indicator of, um, of poor vestibular function. And clumsiness, uh, reoccurring unexplained falls, uh, difficulty to ambulate and move around. Again, a, another element to, to watch out for. So that brings us sort of uh, close to this particular section um, and we'll get ready to do a quick knowledge check and take some questions. Thank you.